Hey, so here we are in the beautiful Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. I'm lucky enough today to be on one of the most remote yet largest islands in the whole Turks and Caicos Island chain. The island I'm on is a private island. I'm lucky enough to be here. There's only a handful of people here. It's best part of a thousand acres in size. So the plan is today to maybe walk for three or four hours, um, see what we can find. I know there's Lots of wildlife here, lots of rock iguanas, some great beaches, some good limestone rock formations. And back in the day, it was home to a fairly small contained um, loyalist plantation um, system of oper operation. Loyalists from the US were given land from the King of England in reward for being loyalists. They came here with their slaves um, set up cotton and sizal plantations, um, worked the land as best they could, stayed for maybe 60 years and then couldn't make it work and disappeared. But what they built and how they changed the land is still here, long abandoned but it's in the bush somewhere. The bush is actually just fairly kind of low lying, there's not much here above 8 or 10 feet. The islands here are very low, very windswept. Um, on the subject of wind, the island here is very thin and narrow. I've got a windward side and a leeward side. Bizarrely, which is not quite the norm, some of the best beaches are on the windward side. So we'll go and check those out first. If you can hear me over the, the wind and the microphone, that'd be great. Um, and then we'll work our way round to the leeward side, try and find some old ruins, maybe some old relics, some artifacts that have been left spot some iguanas and some wildlife on the way. We'll see how we get on. Okay, let's go. SLR, depending on how easy it is to set up and take the shot. We're just going to head down now to one of the nicest beaches and in the same way one of the not so nicest beaches. Okay the bridge path has now expired and I don't want to cut through the, the grassland too much because a lot of ground nesting birds here. So I'm going to basically try and gully to the water's edge, no so much of a beach, and then work my way along on the rocks, see if we can get out there to that point around the corner. Okay, so we're going to try and head down this rock face now, it's about 100 feet, it's made up of sandstone, a little bit of limestone, but very soft underfoot. We're going to see if we can get down that way now and work our way around to the beach. Okay, made it down, slid most of the way like a snow avalanche. Very soft, very fluid. Luckily, only a few fair sized boulders came down with me, and none of the big stuff. I'm gonna work our way around, I'm gonna start my cell phone, have my camera packed away. So we're under the cliff line now, and weirdly enough, no wind. All the wind's going over the top of the ridge, some 60 feet up there. So down here, it's quite still actually. Some fantastic driftwood. This one's maybe 20, 30 feet. Probably cost you 50 grand in a store in LA.
let's work our way around and see what we can find. All that sand, all these fairly large rocks that are white in colour compared to the old original shoreline. That's all came down in the last few years and could even come down now. That's why you never sleep or camp under overhangs like that. Okay, so this is quite interesting. Just heading down to the beach, I've came across this line of driftwood and debris. Not so much human debris, more just driftwood. And there's a line of it leading from the, the path there, and it comes all the way along. It goes back into the bush there. Now in front of it, we've got our normal typical bush and grassland. But you can see the ocean maybe a thousand yards away and what's caused this was Hurricane Irma um, a year or so ago and so this would be the the high tide line and the sea surge that came up here so I imagine for the six months afterwards all this bush would have been dead from salt contamination and the water was probably sitting here for a number of weeks some thousand yards inland Hopefully you can hear me over the wind. It really is quite a stunning beach. Very remote. Hardly anyone comes in. But on the flip side, a lot of debris, a lot of stuff washed ashore, fishing nets, garbage, crates, plastic. It's a real shame. The good and the bad of a remote Caribbean beach. Now if I was in a survival situation, this could be a godsend. Unfortunately though, with the sunlight going through the plastic, the water gets contaminated. But in a life or death situation, assuming that is water and not fuel or some sort of spirit, that can save your life. That's a that's fishing line and some sort of net. Again, terrible for wildlife, turtles, sea life. Now this is very interesting. Talk about two extremes. We're on the far end of the beach now. And we found a TV. Of all the things that could have washed up, it's a TV. But then bizarrely, not 20 yards away from something that's so modern, disposable, and in this environment, ugly, from a discarded TV set, I come across this nestled in the rocks, which is a piece of black handmade glass from an old bottle, very thick, handmade. That's probably mid, early 1700s. 
maybe off a ship that was passing, maybe a ship that wrecked, or more likely from some of the loyalist settlers that were here maybe. Who knows what history that could tell. We've just got a nice size iguana just on the edge of the path there. Let's not spook him too much but we'll try and get him to move. Hey fella. Okay, I'm not sh quite sure how well this will turn out on the camera, but there's a lot of iguanas here, and there's an iguana track that's going off into the bush. Um, obviously, the soil up there is not so soft. There's a little bit of sand here. That's where he's dragged his, tra his tail through, and a few little kind of footprints there where he's pushed himself off. So the iguanas here are quite high in numbers, so it's uh, very common to see, but it's always good to keep a, a look out of your surroundings and be aware of the um, sign that animals and wildlife lead, leave, I should say, give you a good idea of what's about and what to look for. So we're about halfway down the island now, maybe not quite halfway, and the low land on this windward side turned into this lovely ridge and we're going to work our way up that path. This is a great ridge, always reminds me of the UK, of the Sussex Downs, the way this pans out here. It's not limestone, it's just sand that's been built up over thousands of years, almost like a sandstone now, very solid, not as solid as limestone, which we'll come across a little bit later. Okay, we're on top of the ridge now that we saw earlier, and I've got the windward side behind me, and just looking out across the island, which is fairly narrow, and as you can see, fairly remote and barren. Only a couple of houses here. But what is obvious is all the limestone, all the dark gray pieces of rock, which will be used for building and cutting stone. And we'll see that more apparently on some structures when we find them. Okay, we're about an hour or so in, just about at the south end of the island. Um, Wind's starting to turn a little bit, as in drop, as we head from the windward side round to the leeward side. I'm just on this nice little beach here, make a good little future camping spot, I think. Um, just enough wind to keep the bugs away, but nice and sheltered, plenty of firewood. So I'm going to work my way around the point now, and see how we get on. So I've come up to a second ridge, more on the leeward side now, and it almost feels like a different island. The wind's dropped, the ocean this side is flat calm, and I found along this low ridge line, this old almost dry stone wall, left over from a loyalist plantation, made of limestone, just cut roughly, and these stones would have been collected by the slaves and forced to build these long, long walls. I can see another one on the ridge line, way, way up there, which we'll get to shortly. So just walking down one of the service roads from the ridge where we saw the dry stone wall in, and I'd spotted some structures, which should be just up close. More iguana tracks, and there is said rock iguana. So 
So here's the structure that I was looking at. From the shape of it above, I'd say it's a water well or drinking trough for cattle that they would have had here. Look at the stonework in that. Some cut stone in there, not a great deal, but there's definitely some work gone into that. Still standing since the mid 1700s. Let's get into the entrance. I'm always checking around on the floor for any kind of artifacts such as glass or pottery. These are two of the famous Turk's Head Cactus after which the Turks and Caicos is named, apparently. Distinctive red top. And these berries on top, it's what the iguanas eat, as well as other stuff. And they'll spread the seeds um, through their droppings. That's why there's such an abundance. Some of the biggest cactus I've seen here in the whole of the island chain. So I'm not sure if this was a natural door, someone's knocked it down. But yeah, this is a water hole for, for cattle. Ah, got an interesting hermit crab here. Let's go and see this fella before he escapes. Absolutely critical to the local ecology. They're basically the um, the trash guys. They clean up all the debris, any kind of their, they're like the super equivalent of uh, ants. Ants do the small stuff, they do the big stuff. And there's a very variety of sizes. Here's a little guy sleeping here. about as big as your thumb. Okay, just starting to head back now from the ruins back to the um, main dock. Clouds are starting to come in over the ridge. So it's time to get back, but we'll see what we can see on the way. In case anything interesting comes up.